Hello everyone and welcome to episode 5 of the BeagleCast. Today we have special guest Ayush who did his GSOC project with BeagleBoard. So feel free to introduce yourself. Everyone say hi. We have Jason, Deepak and Robert as well. Great. Hi Ayush. Hello. Hello. So the start of the session causes a slight delay when someone starts speaking at the very initial point. Why don't you um, introduce yourself to us a little bit about um, how you got introduced to BeagleBoard, how you found out about BeagleBoard, and, um, and what encouraged you to, to apply for GSOC? Yeah, I've already worked in Google Summer of Code 2022. So initially, I got introduced to BeagleBoard during the maybe maybe candidate before. registration phase, I think it's called, during the March period. So when I was looking at organization, which I'm mostly interested in embedded side of Thing. So I was looking for projects in that particular space and BeagleBoard came up and I was interested in finding out more about Zephyr specifically and the project of replacing Gbridge. Actually, initially I applied for that particular project because it contained that uh, it, it was written that it can be done in Rust, like there was possibility. That's why my initial proposal was in Rust, as you might remember. And then it evolved from there. I have worked in the past with Arduinos and Raspberry Pi, both of them. So like I have a Nano and Uno, uh, Raspberry Pi 3B and a Pico as well. So I've been using those since my school days. And so, yeah, that's how this I came to know about BeagleBoard. And this was the first time like Google Summer of Code when I actually got to know much about Beagle World. Like, I think I've heard about it before since it sometimes came up with Arduino and Raspberry Pi, that side of things, but I'd never actually checked it out before this point in time. Where are you in um, school right now? Or what, um, what's yeah, your first so thing? I'm a fourth year student pursuing mathematics and computing. My degree is basically integrated master of technology, so it's similar to what you might know as dual degrees or bachelor's plus master's, five years. So I am in the fourth year of that particular degree. Uh, mathematics and computing is mostly similar to theoretical computer science. So like we learn about the theory of computation, how the computer system basically involved from your state machine to Turing machines and how that proved in mathematics. Other than that, we go over the mathematics behind cryptography as well and some normal computer science stuff like database and compiler design kind of thing. What attracts you to embedded systems or making making something embedded? Why did you decide you wanted to go and instead of like just use computers, actually make things out of computers? So I initially started with Java in 7th standard. I learned some of it, then I did some Python. I Android development, so I have done your normal Java Android development. I also transitioned to Kotlin at one point, and I was also watching the Google I/O presentation when Flutter 0.1 was announced. I have also done some game development side of things, some JavaScript. Basically, I tried the whole bunch of things. I basically do not like working in front end or any kind of UI environment. Uh, if you ask me to design a graphical application, you will probably see the most hideous thing <laughs> anyone could ever come up with. So I was like completely terrible at that. As for embedded, though, I would have to say it all started because of Rust. So like before Rust, I was bouncing around with different languages, trying something. But, and, but well, I first tried, picked up Rust in like 2019. I gave up. Quickly, it was very difficult. Then I tried again in 2020. I gave up again. And finally, in 2021, with the stabilization of a lot of features, I finally was able to like completely go through the Rust book, understand what the borrowing thing were. And as I did development in Rust, I basically started going to lower and lower levels. Then there was my GSOC 2022 project, which basically involved me having to import the standard Rust library to UEFI environment. So that pushed me again into the level of development where standard libraries cannot be used. And I guess you basically go to embedded the space from there. 
point. I think we should start having a standard question for for people, Andre. Like, um, like when was that first aha empowerment moment? Move, a moment, right? That got you into to computers in general, whether it was embedded or electronics or just just anything. Like for for me, um, you know, I got put in front of a computer and said I could do whatever with it, and I started um, just typing in like something you just print my name on the screen, right? You know, tells you how old yeah. I am, right? You know, it was just like something I created, you know, for a lot of people, it's like Arduino blinking the LED. Um, so what was that hour moment for you, right? What did you sit down and do with the computer or with electronics that said, hey, I can make something out of this? So my kind of brother, cousin brother, he is also a software developer. So the first moment from for me was basically he printed uh, infinite loop of hello world from this and like when i first saw it i was basically blown away like what is going on everything was moving so fast and i could see and i before that i used to play games and with this i finally thought okay so like computer can do much more than just your average games after that it gradually grew from there so like this was back in my fifth or fourth standard days we had some basic programming, like visual basic in six standard. So I did some of that, picked up a Java book in seven standard because back then books still mattered a lot. So it was like head first Java 5. Java 5 was the new thing back then. And then, yeah, from there, that, there was Python from Harvard. Yes, I don't remember the exact class, but it was a pretty famous class. And I also... At the same time, there was this classes that I joined with one of my friends, and there we used to do stuff in Arduino. So I started with normal blinking of LEDs, but we also used various sensors like the ultrasound sensor, there was infrared sensor, and a lot of things to very small, small stuff like street lights that turn on and off using the light sensor and all those things. The major project I with using this knowledge was in 10th standard. So I created a smart home model, which basically used an Arduino, uh, actually two Arduinos, which were connected to a Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi was connected to a server online. And I also made an Android application to control the whole thing. And it was my science fair project. Yeah. And things just escalated from there. I basically liked doing programming in my free time and my parents were not very controlling, so I was free to do whatever I want as long as I just performed decently at school. So yeah, from there, that, that freedom I think is so important, right? Just when you when you're trying to learn and explore, you can just go have the time to go and and just dive in, right? So just being left alone once you get the bug, right? It sounds like you really got the bug, right? You wanted to to dive yeah. in. I was gonna say you're you, yeah kind of like kind of like me your your high school yeah it's um, normally common for people to like study for a main entrance exam from ninth standard onwards and they just concentrate on coursework but my parents were thankfully quite liberal with that stuff so I got opportunity to work on a lot of different things during my school days as well. Your your high school uh, pro uh, project was basically uh, a capstone project. That's like a senior college project, right? <laughs> I think can't hear you, Andre. I don't know. Oh, you can even um, hear me, right? I can hear you great. Um, yeah, okay, just making sure. Yeah, you you can still hear me, right? Yeah, yeah, I can hear. Yeah, you're, it's just just between you two. It sounds sound right. Um, so maybe I, the thing I'm really trying to bite my tongue on is Rust, right? Because I want to just talk a lot about Rust, um, and I think we should, but I think we want to try to save that so maybe we talk a little bit about the GSOC project that you um, created, right? This, um, what we've been doing with this Project Aura code, Graybus, um, you know, I've been excited about it for a long time. It's gone through a lot of people's minds and a lot of people's hands, um, but I, I think what you did was something that's going to help really make it much more um, much more real um, because you helped make it much more stable, right? You kind of took it out of, um, of uh, from from condition it was in into, I think, a, a far better state. And I don't know, could you explain a little bit about what the concept is with, um, you know, Beagle Connect and Graybus, um, what that 
what that is, what the concept is, and and then what you did uh, to make it work better? Yeah, sure. So, so I was started with the concept of modular phone that was started by Google. The concept itself died, but the Grapers protocol, it, it like people saw the potential it could have on IoT and IoT. So at the very basic level, what we can say about Grapers is you can run the consolidate the drivers and actual hardware peripherals computing into a single main node and the device itself can be in anything that's remotely connected to our main node or like directly connected with a wire. Basically, the interface between them does not matter. You, the, both the devices just should be able to communicate with each, each other using the Grebus protocol. So the Grebus protocol defines uh, spec, a specification for like the UART, speed of the power management, and GPI open, and a lot of other peripherals that are used in IIoT, IoT, and actually can be used in other places as well. So by consolidating the drivers itself to a single device, we can have a setup where all the drivers are running in a Linux computer, but the devices, node devices are connected to nodes which run basically Zephyr, FreeRTOS, or anything under the sun. The operating system in the nodes does not matter as long as they can communicate using the Gravis protocol. Uh, um, based, mainly this is useful in like any IoT application because most of the time the nodes are basically just reading some data they will package it into JSON or something and send to a node. So if we just, well, the node themselves does not have to do that kind of processing and basically extracting useful data and you can just move that computation to the main node. It can help in even reducing latency in a lot of cases then you have network anywhere in between them. So why not just move the computation to node? Because in normal setup, you have to do like serialization once in the node, then deserialization in the main central system. And then you will serialize, deserialize, or do something with that data. So by using Grebus, you just have to read the values directly, and you can escape some performance penalties of the hardware in node. Like the node hardware can be basically a single core, very dumb system, and it does not matter. Yeah. So. Um... Like that that's a that's pretty magical to me, right? So you can take something kind of smart like a Linux computer, right? And then you could take you know um, you know something that could be fairly dumb, and and, and actually, which with your code, right, you can actually even simplify it, you know, quite a bit more, right? Because you really don't need much code on here. You don't ever have to change the code on here, no matter what you're hooking it up to, right? There's like thousands of different things you can hook up on the in device, but all the smarts, all the complexity goes into the Linux kernel sitting on the Linux computer, and then you run the exact same code in every single one of um, the little nodes, right, where you hook up the sensors, right, and you just move all the smarts over. Um, so I, I think it's kind of magical. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm excited that you like, saw some potential in it, um, and um, you know, I've done some, some really cool work. So. So what did you do to kind of make that work better, right? Because we had some working code for 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 doing Gray Bus, um, right? Um, you know, between Beagle Play and Beagle Connect Freedom, um, but it had some limitations. And um, so, can you kind of say, you know, what those limitations were and how you helped eliminate them? Yeah. So the Gray Bus protocol basically need an SPC, we call it. And that thing manages all the nodes that are inserted or removed, and the communication between the, our Linux host and the node goes through our AP bridge. Which and both of these things were actually running on user space Linux right now. So we currently had a setup where we were first using GB Connect to pass messages from kernel space to user space. These messages were read and used by the user space running SPC, which was called Gbridge. This was then passing the messages back to kernel space. 
so there was ETF serial and ETF serial was using WPAN USB as well. And finally, the code actually went to the CC1352 coprocessor that's 10 bigger there. And this coprocessor itself did some WPAN USB cover, uh, like it was providing IEEE E802 communication to our Linux host. Since that uh, six low pan communication are only available in CC1352. So the Linux host does not directly have access to those antennas. And our Beagle Connect Freedom node will then communicate with this CC1352. The messages will then pass from kernel space to user space back to the kernel space. And as you can see, the there was a lot of complexity in this architecture. So you have GB connect, GB netlink, which passes to mes messages to G bridge that pass the messages to BCF serial that does to WPAN USB that finally does send the messages to CC one three five. What I basically did was simplify this whole setup into two components. So there is the Zephyr application that runs in CC one three five two and a Linux driver. And the whole dance song and dance with the user space is gone now. And the CC1352 and Linux driver communicates directly. So this allows a lot of things like specifically the latency is good. You can say that. And since this setup is a lot simpler, upstreaming it is also a lot simpler. If we have Grables in our upstream Linux code, it will be much appealing to people to use it and the stability guarantees of the next and it just has a much good, better impression than something that's experimental. Until now, it was mostly experimental and quite interesting. So people who thought that it might be useful in the future, they could go and play with it, but that was all they could do. Now we have Beagle Play and BCF, Beagle Connect Freedom, which can basically seamlessly work over Grables with a single Linux driver and a uh, Zephyr application and without any intervention from user. And it does seem like magical. I think it really does seem like magic. So now with the, the code, so if you run the firmware on the 1352 and you load the driver, right, on the Beagle Play, then anytime somebody powers up a Beagle Connect Freedom, right, it's going to show up as having these two new micro, microbus ports, right, on Beagle Play, right? So just they'll just show up as if they're like dynamically added directly to the board, right? Yeah, along with the temperature and humidity sensor and the optical sensor. Right, yeah, because yeah, it directly includes the support for the sensors that are already built in, but also provides the expansion so you can do iSpread C transactions over the bus. Yeah, I forgot about the fact that you've got the three sensors that are built in. Yeah. So automatically that data just like, it, it, it will just, auto if you turn one on, the data will just, Start showing up as an I/O device on the um, the Beagle Play, right? So, and you just have to. You also have to flash this, right, with some particular firmware, right? Um, yeah. So it needs to be flashed with the same firmware we were using before, and so the BCF Rebus Node firmware, and it should work the whole setup. The latency of the system, like I could measure it under fifty milliseconds, so which I think is quite good for the setup. There can be some more optimization and we have to check like how it reacts when, a, when the number of nodes increases a lot. But I tried to make the biggest thing I did to make the latency lower was to make the CC1352 code as dumb as possible because it's like a single board processor. And technically it does not need to care which messages it, it is passing from our host to node. So I tried to make it as dumb as possible to get the maximum performance out of it. And I think 50 milliseconds latency over the air is quite good for now, initial. Yeah, when you're, and is that for like a full sensor read or is that just for um, like a single packet? So it, uh, a single packet would be around 30 to 40 milliseconds if we disable the, the new oh. debug messages. Yeah. Okay. If Jason's video dropped, they might have lost power like that. Can you hear me? Are you still? There he is. He's back. Hey, just looks like your uh, no. your drop there. Connection drop. Uh, so yeah, so far a single packet that takes around thirty milliseconds. This actually can be improved further. So I was thinking of doing using a single TCP connection 
instead of a TCP connection for every keyboard, that could massively increase the performance as well. And the PCF node code need, does need some improvement. So I think there's a lot of room for improvement. Okay. Well, hopefully we can um, you know, continue to work together to improve the, the state of the code. Um, there's a number of other interesting components, I think, to the whole um, solution. It seems like we're the only ones connected. Oh, Andre can hear us. Um, oh, you can. Um, Got it there, yeah. Okay. Um, the, um, uh, the like the, the microbus driver is still kind of a separate thing from 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 all of this, right? So, um, are you using the microbus driver kind of in your stack, or um, how does the microbus driver relate to the the, the gray bus driver? Yeah, so the microbus driver needs to be present for specifically the parsing side of things. So currently, the BCF node use the extension to your normal gray bus manifest, and the parsing logic is in microbus driver, and the support for microbus as well as in the microbus driver. But the gray bus driver is not directly using it, but indirectly, it definitely depends on microbus driver. So like if you tried using it in mainline, it will currently not do much, then the parsing will fail without the microbus driver. So I'm thinking of taking up the work to upstream microbus driver once the gray bus driver stuff is done. Yeah, because the, 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 at the gray bus point, you have the I2C, the SPI, the UART, the GPIO, the analog, right? All of that you know, being packetized across whatever the connection is, right? You could do it over serial. In this case, we're doing it over... Um, the 802.15.4G, the sub gigahertz network um, as TCP packets, right? But you could do any sort of transport, right? You've got firmware on the 13.52 with the that um, you know the six low pan stack, right? Handling all the the, the packet transitions on both sides, right? Um, but that just gets you the, those those bus drivers, right? And those dynamic bus um, um, connections. Um, but the micro bus driver that gets you what actually loads the driver for Things like the OPT 3001 light sensor, the HTC 2010 um, temperature humidity sensor, right? So the, the the kernel now knows to not just like get those buses, but actually load the drivers for the things that are connected up to the buses as well. So the kernel does have support for some reverse devices. I'm not yeah. sure which one, but yeah, anything with microbus will technically not work without the microbus driver in the yeah, if he, if there's a there's a sensor um, um, like a, instead of actually doing the low level uh, you know iceberg C uh, transactions which we're doing today, um, there's an easy path to kind of optimize things by using the sensor connection. But, but that's going to essentially require on the node side to actually have a sensor driver. Um, but that has the opportunity to you know do things like do more power savings. Um, more like event triggers um, based things like, you know, only send a message when the light level changes by so much or other, other things like that, right? So you could you could potentially still put a lot more sparks into the sensor, but this gives you a ton of capability just without ever touching the firmware on the, the node, right? Not ever touching the firmware on the node, talk to just a huge selection of different um, sensors without ever touching the code. Thanks to moving the complexity over to the Linux side. So you've got some plans for what you might do in the future. Um, so um, what's what's your what's your outlook? What 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 are your ambitions? Right? What are you going to do from what you've learned out of GSOC and um, getting connected to the open source developer community? Uh, as I outline, I will work on upstreaming the Gribbles driver. Along after that, I have the microbus stuff to figure out. I'm also working on some. Rust side of things, maybe integrating Rust into Zephyr, like Linux kernel does currently. I also have some stuff from my past GSOC work, so I'm still working on the port of UEFI, getting that upstream, adding more capabilities, testing it out as well. And other than that, I'm trying to find an internship for the next year. Would you graduate? Uh, so I graduate in some May 2025, but we have to do a compulsory internship during summer 2024. Uh, you, you, you might have some good luck finding some internship opportunities at Beagle. So really appreciate the work you've done here. Um, and 
Um, yeah, I don't know if you comments on that before we allow the, the rust gates to open up. Um, any, any questions from other folks before we let the before we start diving into rust? Oh, I think I think you can go straight away. Um, just uh, being mindful of the time, we have about fifteen minutes left here. So all right, oh, <laughs> we could easily blow that talking about rust. I I, oh, I ran into uh, I I, I kind of randomly ran into a co a, a colleague of um, Andre's. Um, he um, was at Purdue um, with, at the same time as Andre was and. Um, and he has some 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 rust um, affinity, uh, and um, um, so I, I kind of um, I I use Python on a regular basis, but um, I I will admit I am a um, I'm a Python hater. Um, I despise the language to no end, and the the, the sheer amount of of uh, libraries in PyPy. Um, that don't have proper exception handling, um, that, that don't oh, handle yeah. the, the exceptions from the I packages that they have been working um, I'm ranting on Python so that we give a platform to... Uh, to that's that's a fresh from Hershey's. Jason's rants on, Jason's rants on <laughs> Python. <laughs> Are you sure you're able to hear any of that? So, like, with, with, with Python and, and even worse, like, the language itself is kind of bad, but but um, you know, in in some ways, but I I have to appreciate how much people are learning it, how much um, it's urging people to get into programming, um, and and how much they're able to accomplish with it. Um, but they're also able to pick up some really really bad habits um, from a um, you know kind of a scalable programming side of things. Um, exception things handling, like, like that it's yeah loosely typed things like that is not going to ever lead to good. Yeah, I don't mind loosely typed so much. Um, I don't. I don't. Um, yeah, it, it is. A, it can be a real problem, right? Um, and you know, memory management and many things um, can 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 lead to, to real problems. Um, yeah, that's a that's a good thing to hate on, I guess. Um, is the the dynamic typing? But um, I was trying to hate on the uh, the, the exception handling. For me, that's the. Um, well, I mean, and, and a lot of those, like when you try to use the type the wrong way, that's one of those great ways to get one of those exceptions. Um, yeah. You know, you often expect some value to have a certain type, and, and then when you try to treat it as the wrong type. Um, and yeah, and you learn about many weird and wonderful data types they didn't realize existed, and you can kind of kind of mutate into the right shape, but sometimes not. Mm -hmm. And then it yeah. depends on how you interpret external inputs, because sometimes you'd be like, well, the same variable got it, you know. Sometimes it's a string, sometimes it's an int. <laughs> I thought you could pretty much always do double quotes plus in anything, and it would give you some valid output, right? Yeah, I think so. It's just it depends when you when you mix it with like some weird libraries that are half Python, half C. You you not end up every type has a string. waters. Yeah, not a, not every type has a good string conversion. They just don't. Um, not, not even. Oh, and how many times I've I've gone insane going, um, you know, trying to print trying to print a string versus like the ASCII representation of a string. So I'm like, the word hello is equal to hello, and Python goes no. <laughs> <laughs> like ah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but it's great. So many people getting into it. I think the PyPy stuff kind of escalates it though because um, there's not like a Quality control in in the PyPy itself. Um, and it kind of ruined Node for me a lot too. I used, I'm a big um, Douglas Crockford made JavaScript a language that I felt comfortable using um, when he wrote the JavaScript, the good parts, right? And said, use this, don't use that. Um, yeah. And you could kind of create a style in JavaScript that was pretty functional. Um, but you know, I, I, you know, there's a recent blow up on. Uh, on a TypeScript, uh, there was a, the guy that did 37 signals, um, dropped it from a project. Um, he said, no more TypeScript, um, going pure JavaScript. Um, but much like Python and PyPy, um, NPM kind of ruined Node.js for me. Yeah. Um, JS was too slow to come. And, um, you know, the, um, yeah, the, the, the lack of quality control on NPM and the fact that everybody thought disk space, the, 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 the thou shalt believe that disk space is free. And so, you know, you, you, you find the same library 30 times in a project, all different versions, um, you know, so to make sure that they work because only that exact version work. It, it's, it's, it's great, but I think actually defining APIs, um, having real definitions, 
Um, yeah, I mean, Python's trying to solve that with VMs, right? Kind of, but yeah, yeah, and I um, and that's how I used most of my Python stuff was with with VMs, but it, it doesn't really solve the problem. Um, and that's why I really just try to encourage people when they use Beagles, learn how to use the kernel. Um, and, um, you know, especially if you get stuff into mainline, right, the, the, the trick with, with mainline is even though it's a little bit of a wild west in terms of APIs, once you get it in, nobody can change the interface without fixing your code, right? So um, the, the contract is, is once it's in mainline, um, that you have to keep it. So there is only one, right? I don't have to deal with the IPI, NPM, Wild West. Um, you know, this version is not compatible with this version. Not compatible. It's like when you put all the code into one place, um, you know, and you have all the, the quality control checks from all the massive number of users, right? You, you end up with code that works um, and works every time. Um, and it's interesting right now that, that you can actually use Rust now in the Linux kernel. Um, so I think Ayush was really trying to do more to, to get Rust into the, um, the Zephyr kernel as well. Is there, your audio good now, Ayush? Yeah, I think so. So, so, so pile in on other languages and espouse the, the virtues of Rust. Uh, so it's not like Rust has only virtues. There are problems as well. But what I basically like about Rust is it enforces all the best practices you use on C and just makes the compiler check them for you. So I'm most of the people who use C and embedded kernel side of things already know a lot about how there should not be multiple writers and how you should free memory. Like they already understand all of those things pretty well. The, what the borrow checker is actually trying to do. There is a particular term for that pattern of programming. I don't actually remember it, but yeah. So Plus basically enforces all those good practices in its compil compilation state. And sometimes when like you really need to do something that only you know that it is safe for a particular reason. Like you know that it is a single core computer and it will do things in this specific order. So even if the code looks like it's using multiple threads, it will never lead to a race condition. And in that cases, you will use unsafe rust, which is fine. Like people have this notion that unsafe rust is somehow bad, but unsafe rust is just basically as bad as C is. So at worst, rust is as bad as for audio. And But most of the time, it is actually quite useful. And I'm talking about using it without the standard library. Oh, and we lost, we lost Aish. Hello? I can hear you, Jason. Yeah, yeah, you're back, Aish. Oh, yeah. So, as I was saying, at first, it is as bad as C. And at best, it basically allows you to a, a not a screen that Node.js 16 is now end of life. Yeah, no, Jason, Aish is back. You, you, you. Okay. okay, sorry. So, like, I'm just talking about using Rust without the standard library. Standard library is not useful in embedded context. So you can just use the core of Rust and the allocation side of Rust without actually using the standard library. And that in on itself gives you a lot of benefits of a normal ROS. And when you need the power of ROS, you can just use unsafe Rust and you can basically write exactly the same code as if you want. So yeah, unsafe. Uh, like I have heard this from a lot of people, but unsafe rust is not a bad thing. You cannot program in embedded environments or like a lot of places without unsafe rust. Uh, linked lists are basically possible in safe rust because of the way pointers work and you are technically pointing to a lot of things which might or might not be valid. But you can make, yes, you can actually know that they are valid even though the computer cannot. In those cases, unsafe is completely valid. And it, using unsafe rust basically shows you that, yeah, this point of code can cause problems. The You are saying it's fine, so the compiler believes it's fine, and it's now your responsibility. You can probably, yeah, I think you can uh, do some good isolation, though, between unsafe regions and safe regions, right? Is there, there you can potentially make unsafe, you know, portions, so you can isolate that, right? So you can make sure to do the right inspection on the code that you're making unsafe. Yeah, so, so basically, generally, the accepted way is 
that you put anything that you think might cause problems or that the compiler cannot reason about in the unsafe section. Uh, actually, if I go into more detail, the unsafe section actually does not allow you to bypass the follow checker, okay? It only allows you to dereference raw pointer. You cannot dereference raw pointer in safe Rust. And since you can now dereference raw pointer, you can dereference null memory region and all those things. So that's why it's called unsafe Rust. That's basically the only thing you can actually do in a The ability to dereference raw pointers gives you a lot of other things that you can do, but that's the basic principle of unsafe. So as you can see, the borrow checker will work in unsafe Rust the same way it does in safe Rust. So what would you recommend anybody do that wanted to learn the Rust programming language? So <laughs> learning Rust can be quite hard if someone is not already familiar with or C++ or any non gt language, okay? If you already know C++ in detail, you can just go through the Rust book and everything should work out fine. It's a very long book, but it's well worth it. You kind of have to go through it and try to experiment with the borrow checker. So, like, you have to first reach the limitations of borrow checker. Initially, you will be fighting with borrow checker. Then you will start being quite productive. So, like, Initially, you will be somewhere here. Then in the middle portion, you will be here. Okay. And then you will again come down to here when you are doing a lot of advanced stuff because the borrow checker can be quite annoying in those advanced cases as well, just like it is in the initial portion. But the difference between the initial problem and final one is you will understand why the borrow checker is complaining. And initially, you will just think that it is fitting the gatti out of in the terminal. Another thing is, while run, learning Rust, you really should see the compiler messages. That's very useful. People coming out, coming from Java and stuff, basically ignore the compiler messages because they mostly don't say much. But Rust error messages are really nice, and you should definitely use them as a reference when fixing things. And yeah, Rust, I think you have to experiment with it. You cannot just go through the language because initially you will see the borrow checker rules and they're like your four rules and you will think that it's quite simple and when you go to program you will soon realize that no it's not as simple as i thought and sometimes you will be able to see over oh, that this might be the problem by the compiler is saying no to me and sometimes it will just seem arbitrary and you will not be able to figure out why the code is wrong uh, and as i get, as said as you if you are more experienced with C++, you will generally like Rust more, okay? Since you will understand the principles behind why something is wrong. Yeah, I um, I found two. So I've I've this this thing called Coens, uh, K O A N S, is something that that I've stumbled upon to learn different languages. And there's a Rust Coens, um, but I think it kind of comes from the Ruby world, and um. I found it a really nice way to kind of learn new programming languages because you start with kind of a just a simple test framework and a bunch of buggy code, and you just like keep working on the bugs to so understand the feature. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so you just kind of use each feature of the programming language um, uh, through the test bench to try to, to to kind of learn the way at which you you write things um, in Rust. And I really love the Cohen's approach. It's really been super powerful for me to kind of learn. Um, new programming languages. Um, the other thing I, you mentioned the the compiler sh uh, messages, right? Sometimes, like if you can get yourself into the right mindset, right? It, they're um, it can be a bit complicated, a bit verbose, um, but the Rust compiler does a really really nice job of telling you what's wrong with your code, and usually tells you how to fix it too, um, right? A lot of times you can. Just kind of dig through its hint, and it's telling you exactly what you need to do to fix your code. Um, and it just wants to make sure this is what you really mean, right? So, hey, if this is what you really mean, this is how you should express that to me. Um, and it's, it, so it's it's really a lot better at that than most other programming languages. Um, and and so looking at the messages from the compiler and taking your time and reading them over and over again giving yourself some, some time with those errors is really a great way just to learn the programming language itself. The compiler wants to teach you. 
think somebody did a really great example of just writing hello world um not in rust just typing it in like python or c like something that you know then try to compile it with the rust compiler and it'll tell you everything that you're doing wrong um so you have your hello world program i will say we also have the uh the rust um sub channel on discord so for any questions there you know i'm sure Ayush is, is there every once in a while we have the folks in the shunt because they're interested to discuss rust yeah so yeah get up on the the the, the beagle discord um uh, Nishant is too, too bad he's not here because he actually worked on a, um, a, a project to demonstrate how to run Rust on the um, R5s on BeagleBone AI 64, right? So a way to... And he also, he also has it on the Cortex-M on BeagleBlay. Ah, perfect. Cortex-M on BeagleBlay. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And now um, the, the other DSOC project that's already wrapped up um, as one that's got a, a, a pull request into the Zephyr to run Zephyr on the R5s and M4s. So that's that's still going on somewhat, but the pull request is there um, for Zephyr on those cores, right? So it'd be interesting to combine that with the Rust um, and put it all into to, to one simple experience for, for, for Rust programming on the microcontrollers. Good places to provide some links in the show notes. We'll have those in the show notes. <laughs> well, I think I think we're basically at time, but thank you very much, Ayush, for joining us. That was that was really good. Hopefully you join us in the future again, because this was just a great discussion. Um Jason, yeah. any other closing thoughts? Um no, I mean I think that the, the um, if, maybe we should include some links about kind of how to get started, right? Because I think maybe some people want to try some of this code out. Um and um you know, we don't have time to kind of dive into it with Robert as to what the state is getting into the images right now. But um, you know, maybe once this yeah. is um, once maybe once everything is kind of merged into the latest Beagle Play image, so that they can use um, use this, right? Maybe we can uh, send out some more info on it. Yeah. So status right now for mainline for uh, his patch that I've been merging them into the six five and six dot six branches. So we found that there was an interesting oops in six dot six. I forwarded that over. Um, I think the code's a little old, but I think our big plan is we're going to merge it back to the six dot one. So five dot ten will be the old BCF serial. That's kind of it. Let's say non development point right now. And so I'd like to move to your tree for 6.1 release and the mainline branches. Very cool. So once you upgrade to a 6.1 kernel, you'll, you'll kind of make this switch over to, instead of using the BCF serial driver, using the gray bus driver on, on the G2. Yeah, so let me check. I think I just nuked the uh, over the weekend. Uh, I was backporting BCF because there was a couple more changes that 6.1 needed. And I think I just removed it all and just basically blessed this newer version. Maybe we should um, drop and um, also put a, a drop on the Mesa status while we're talking about 6.1 or 6.5. So the, we're, we're uh, on Mesa. On uh, the Mesa status, uh, I spent a lot of time over the weekend playing of 6.1 or 6.6 RC1 and trying to get that to work. Um, some features are not in the branches yet. So while they posted, I think it was RFC 6, the kernel abstractions they're working on that talk back to Mesa, it seems like the Mesa team's actually waiting for something to hit mainline before they actually commit the changes in Mesa. So it's closer, but it needs some work. So yeah, over the weekend, I was spent a lot of time trying to give the Beagle community an uh, out-of-box Mesa image. We are close. <laughs> you know the next the, the, you know the, the next month or two the monthly release i think is just going to be like so exciting because uh, robert just always can't appreciate enough what you do for the beagle community um but like getting open source 3d graphics and getting um you know beagle connect plus gray bus experience that's just working transparent i'm i'm really excited about what's coming in the next couple months and for some of us, go way back thinking. I remember when uh, uh, Cohen Cooey um, first got it working with 2.6.26 back with the old OMAP 3. Like, oh, we got open, we got GPU working. And then it was always, well, it's hack, hack, hack since, but you know, 15 years ago when we saw that, like, oh, well, and now we're coming it'll to the. Never mean, it'll never mean um, like somebody needing to compile from the DDK again, right? Against a you know a certain image, right? Just be forever open. And what's nice is the with the 
frame buffer support going in 6.6. Oh. All you really need is the DRM patch set, which I merged. I think it's eight patches, but then it's on the Mesa side. Uh, a lot of the infrastructure has been in place, but the kernel uh, WinSys driver to talk to the two, they're really waiting on the kernel to be pushed to mainline before they finish that side. So there's it's the communication that doesn't work right now. Well, knock on wood, it's finished in the next uh, before the next uh, monthly, right? Because we just you just put one out a week and a half ago. To yeah, right now, I actually got that set up as a daily build. So um, we could actually share this. Later at this point, it's a matter of time, not an if. Yeah, it's it's not it's a win now. It's going to happen. I'll put this on a real class sharing, but. Uh, this right now is a daily build. Um, it does the rogue uh, firmware load up. Um, it's just the Mesa side it's missing right now. So the GPU is video, the rogue stack, I think it's V6 of Sarah, Sarah Walker's patch set is enabled on that. Yeah. You can say we're so close to having OpenGL work out of the box, you can taste it right now. What does OpenGL taste like? <laughs> Sweat, tears, oh. uh, <laughs> pain, anguish. Oh, well, I should say it's Vulcan, so it's going to taste a lot better. Yeah, so right now I get to the point where I can call Vulcan info and then the GPU fails. It, it knows there's a GPU there, so you know. And one of the fun ones is because Panfrost was also enabled in uh, Mesa. Right now, the issue there was can't connect to Panfrost. Like, oh, yeah, well, we don't have that GPU. But that was kind of funny. Okay, well, sooner rather than later. So yeah, once this actually happens, it's uh, if you watch uh, Beagle play in Discord, we'll be like, hey, this works now. But we'll definitely be in the forum saying, hey, here's a GPU build that works. And uh, one of the things Andre and I want to do is once it does work, we want to help push it to build root too, so build root will have it enabled. Because we have the display 6.6, .6, we have U-boot is now mainline, and so once OpenGL works, it's like, yep, we got to spread it out. It's very close, and we already have AM62 SK and build root, so. Yep. But not with uh, mainline u -boot. that's the one problem. Not yet, yeah. All right. That's also Chandra, I, I uh, created another u -boot branch uh, yesterday. That might actually, you, you might be able to use oh. USK AM62's uh, changes in build root, and just use that branch on top of their tree. Okay, I can include that. They're going to have a lot of show notes right at the last 10 minutes, right? Because uh, yeah. uh, just kind of this information. It's going to be it's going to be like two big sections and then like 15 at the end. Really. <laughs> well, it's more like, uh, what have you guys done in the last two weeks? Oh, all this. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we'll we'll catch we'll catch everyone up sooner than, rather than later. Keep your eyes out on the forum. Keep your eyes on Discord. Thanks again, Robert, Jason, Ayush. Again, we hope we have you in the future again. And yeah, thanks for another great episode.